What's with the Hawaiian shirt? Because nothing says aloha like an ice field. Hey, this was a bad decision. Why? The rope is free. What? The rope is free. The rope's free? Ah, shit. Apart from the climbing, our objective was to cross the Juneau Glacier into Atlin, Canada. That would require a 76-mile journey, where we'd exit out the Llewellyn Glacier after having crossed the Canada-US border, separating Alaska from British Columbia. To succeed, we needed to average 15 miles per travel day when we weren't climbing, which would require four pounds of bacon, two eight millimeter ropes, outdated phones in lieu of heavy cameras, a pair of DIY ice goggles, some questionable glacier experience, a lot of whiskey, and two recreational mountaineers, arguably in over their heads. Well, it's the same as any other heli drop. It's, it's pretty sudden and quite disorienting at first. It's very bright. There's nothing but ice and snow as far as you can see. Yeah, I forgot my rash cream. Oh, no, my rash. Oh, fuck. Hmm. What's up? What? I forgot my ski pass. <laughs> well, we're two feet into our traverse and we both tipped our sleds. Dude, this is not looking good. And I look back and Vinny, his sled is continuously tipping over and I'm kind of hoping he figures it out and I'm just trucking along these huge sun cups. So I go back and I just had to redistribute some of that weight. We're only about 15 miles in, but my feet already hurt. Don't tell Cam. Foot therapy was uh, a needed technique for Vincent whose uh, feet were too hot. They were sizzling in his tight little boots. You know, you get that sloshing, you get that foot swelling, and then it rubs on the bottom, and it gets too hot. And I would just yell. Because Cam was usually in the front as the expedition leader, I would usually yell, Cam, I need to, I need to do my feet. And so he had to, every once in a while, take his feet out of his boots, sit on a sled, and stick them right in the snow and just cool them down. But we had a very clear objective and where we needed to go, which was the Norris Ice Fall that goes onto the, I believe, the southwest branch of the Taku. I looked at a USGS geologic map of southeast Alaska and it showed that there was a granitic rock through that whole sub-range. It's figured there could be some good climbing that way. The first time I saw the Oregon Pikes was actually from the summit of the North Taku Tower. It's just a small range of a few peaks northeast of the Taku Glacier. The Oregon Pipes itself is the northernmost peak and it was first climbed by Fred Becky and company in uh, what, 1948 or so. I mean, if you know the rock type, then you can kind of piece together areas that would have higher probability of quality climbing. I think Vinny came up with the appropriate name, the Oregon Pipette. It's two peaks southeast of the Oregon Pipe itself. It's between the Oregon Pipes and Hodgkin's Peak. Uh, we were a little bit uncertain in the route at first. There was a prominent buttress, just climbers left of the face route that we ended up taking. Which was the obvious route. Okay, that's moderate terrain that will get us up the mountain. What we ended up deciding was to just go to the base of it and deciding between climbing the buttress or climbing the face. And to our knowledge, neither of them had been climbed. And As we got closer, we were just looking at this face and like, huh. Man, that's a lot of cracks. You would think one of those cracks is going to be an option that's going to get us up that mountain. And then we we're like, should we do it? And it was just pretty clear that we th uh, thought it would go. Just sort of picked a line, kind of started off with some more broken slabs at the bottom and then steepened up. Yeah, and we just started taking crack system after crack system, and each one led to a beautiful belay ledge, seven pitches of just glorious moderate granite climbing. Hey, Cam, you know what I call that pitch? Unreal! We kept looking at each other like, this is gonna get bad. We're gonna get to something really hard or something really dirty. But it was just like immaculate climbing. I'm telling you, you just gotta make it out there. It's worth the jaunt. There was a money pitch. I think you know the money pitch, Vinny. <laughs> you took the money pitch. <laughs> it was the crux pitch. You basically climb through this like little teepee of conjoining cracks and you go through a little bulge and then into some flared finger cracks. And it's yeah, pretty exciting, pretty exciting climbing, I thought. 
and it was insane. It was splitter on splitter crack. It felt like somebody had cleaned this route and it was a 50 classic of America. You know what sucks though? What? There's an anchor right there. No. Oh, what? <laughs> what? Where? Nah, dude, I'm just kidding. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, <F> <laughs> <laughs> what? No! <laughs> oh, yeah. And I was immediately like, what? <laughs> How? Why? <laughs> Who's bolting up here? No, we didn't, we didn't see any, any sign of other climbers. And nor did we leave anything behind on that route. We got to the top, and it was, it was phenomenal. Yeah, goddamn, dude. I was just like, just thinking, like, man, this is one of the best rock climbs I've ever done. I know! <laughs> it's like really good. What a view. What a view. There's a cloud there. Where's our tent? It's Louis Dot, just at the end of that it's like bridge. right there. We're in the middle of fucking nowhere. This looks like the Arctic. Dude, I know. <laughs> what can I say about Cam? Um, Cam's one of those guys with a real strong head game the kind of climber where the whole mountain could be collapsing on top of you and while we're all losing our freaking marbles, he's actually busy making moves to get us out. Why did I call Vinny for this? Oh, all my other partners are fishing right now in Bristol Bay. <laughs> but that's not to talk shit about Vincent. I'd love climbing with Vincent and it had been a while and I knew he would be good for this. The biggest factor was getting him up here from Squamish and convincing him to fly up. Dude, that's like a couple of days notice. I don't even know where my ice pick is. The easiest part of that was the weather window we got. Something like that just doesn't come around too often up here. But yeah, I just trusted him. You know, I've climbed with him before and it's not too often you can find someone in the mountains that you can just trust and know that they'll be fine on a trip, you know? So yeah, pretty happy with our partnership. I don't really know. Ah. Hey! Oh, you got a smaller basket. Oh, whatever. Yay! Hey! And inside, and then inside, inside, and then outside, and then, then cross. Yeah. Oh, dude, you picked that up so quick. Hey, hey, oh, ah, yep, oh, hey. It's opening up. Uh, what did happen on Devil's Paw? Devil's Paw is an interesting mountain. It's built on a basement complex of granite, but then transitions into this volcanic rock on top. So it was a very distinct line of these two rock types. Both are chassis. The entire way up on their ridge, we're simul climbing, and I was like, yo, I don't know what everyone's complaining about. This thing is bomber. It's sweet rock. We're totally fine. And then I start up on the climb. We finally bust out two eight mils. So I start up my lead. Well, the first move, I'm like, this is gonna go well. This day's on its way. Second move, it looks like this is part of the wall. And all of a sudden, the wall is no longer part of the wall and the wall's coming at me. And it turns out it was this massive boulder and it's on top of me. I'm midair, I do like some finicky dance move to dodge this thing. Somehow it doesn't land on my foot. Then I look down and then now, cam, it's coming right at him. I jumped out of the way and- Both like kind of do a pat down, like, you good? And he's like, I'm, I'm good. And then I'm like, how's the rope? It's cut in half. It's cut in half there. It's fucked here. It's fucked in his hand. So now we got this rope and decisions. Counted six core shots. So in the span of 30 seconds, we were heading up and then we were heading down. I'm so sorry. It happens, buddy. man. It's, it's all right. I'm just glad you're safe and I'm safe. We can continue our journey. Jesus Christ. We still had one rope left and it was pretty clear that the commitment was gonna uh, be too high to make it worth it with only a single eight mil rope for this route. Smart, smart call. But yeah, it was just, uh, it's kind of what it is in the mountains. But I think I'll be back for it. Just a good little warm up for our attempt on Michael's <laughs> Uh, 
Where are we going, Vinny? I don't know. Could go over there, I guess. Michael Sword was also climbed in Fred Becky's 1949 expedition, and he described it as the most earnest climbing we had ever encountered. It was incredibly special to walk the footsteps of such a legend, to clip his old pitons, find his tat, and the old artifacts we'd find. What in the name of extraterrestrial bullshit is this? It's got a wheel. I mean, the guy did it in his tennis shoes just after World War II, so we felt like with our Vibram soles, we could do it in our sneakers too. Hey, you thinking what I'm thinking? getting off this thing we had some miscommunication on our down climb that was bad on my part i went too far down climbing to where we couldn't communicate effectively a lot of rope drag and it ended up where Vinny was down climbing with a lot of slack in the system you know how they say simul climbing can be quite precarious will you ever try downward simul climbing leading down climbing is opposite so the leader is basically on top rope and the follower is uh basically on lead taking the risk of a whipper for terrain like that where you're on a ridge it kind of makes sense i think god i love it Vinny and i had a little disagreement on our rappelling we came up probably about a 120 meter face in the back of the cirque and Vinny saw this route straight down the face which would avoid walking all the way back around to our initial starting point so it saves some time there but it's also about twice as high of a face and and extremely loose. It was one of those situations where there really wasn't a very good option. There was only different bad options. So we ended up doing seven repels. Did my fear of heights become apparent? Yeah, it did. When it got dark and we ended up on a blank face of granite with a small seam and I had plugged in a bunch of nuts, Vinny was a little bit- I'm not scared, uh, you're scared. What did you say coming up? Like, what is this, the Dawn Wall? <laughs> well, I really hope I don't die in these repels. Um, I love you, LJ. Jesus Christ, that was death, man. Well, welcome to Alaska, buddy. Well, I could probably grab that Dear John letter I gave you for LJ now. Uh, might as well hold on to that for a bit longer. We're not out of this yet. At this point, we'd traveled about 29 miles to Devil's Paw, with still 47 miles left up ahead. We'd set our sights on the Icefield Research Lodge, which led me to ask the obvious question, will there be ladies and chicken wings? Vince, it's not a Hooters. I'm a tourist stranger And I'm going dancing tonight Please, please stop Oh my god, stop I think I got a good name for this place. Beep, beep. What? The Canadian Sahara. Yeah, I like it. It's like a desert of ice. An endless ocean of where the fuck are we? I swear that mountain's messing with me. 
It hasn't moved. It's been like two days. What would happen if we ran out of sunscreen? And if I can call a helicopter, because I don't know. <laughs> Get the Hooters. Buffalo chicken wings. Hooters. Just gotta get to the Hooters. I'm so thirsty. Just go you know, get some chicken wings and blow your boobs. Water, water, water. Hooters. Buffalo chicken wings. Take you away. When we'd finally crossed the desert and arrived at the Science Lodge, we received devastating news, simply because of what it meant to us. What it meant to us? It meant everything to us. Do they have chicken and boobs? It's locked. So, since Hooters was closed and we still had about two pounds of bacon left, Butter Miso Martini, Cam decided to make his own celebratory cocktail. Oh, the best for after a day of travel. So I've been thinking, how many people since the inception of humankind have ever actually engaged in a circle jerk? What? Yeah. 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 I'm wearing a skyscraper. How are you feeling? Feel pretty fucked. We're almost not there. That's true. And once we are there, we're still nowhere. What are you doing? Meditating. I call your move the broke back ostrich. From Adlin Lake, we got this charter boat made out of metal. This man picked us up, drove us across this beautiful lake for like two hours, and then we get to this cute little town of Atlin. Oh, it's Come on. Why do they call the pickup if they never pick us up? Dad! Oh yeah, so I don't know what it is about like our physical appearance. Maybe we look sketchy, maybe our toboggan sled backpack setup was just untrustworthy, but Nobody picked us up. I wear these glasses so you can't see my tears. We eventually got picked up, but we had to like <laughs> camp overnight. Next one, next one. And then second day after another five hours, we eventually smuggled our way back across the border to America in a camper truck. But then we finally made it to Skagway where our new friends from Alaska Mountain Guides finally gave us our delicious chicken. <laughs> Oh, and all